Sunil, thank you very much for being our guest today on this uh, podcast show of uh, Better Tech. And we hope to have a great conversation with you and that could be useful for our audience. The journal uh, uh, conversation, the subject of the conversation is around finding how C- CTOs uh, get ROI for their organizations, but obviously we can touch upon on various topics. Uh, so before we start off, how about Leo, you take a few moments and introduce yourself uh, to our audience and we, we can take stuff from there. Sure, thank you. And thanks for having me. Uh, so Leo Barala, I am a Chief Technology Officer at, uh, at Takeda uh, and I have responsibilities across uh, multiple, what we actually call shared services across the organization, starting from uh, Enterprise architecture. Um, I actually uh, own the the cloud program uh, and the execution of the cloud program at Takeda. Um, architecture is also responsible for application rationalization, setting standard uh, governance. Uh, I also uh, manage a, a team that that, 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 that supports uh, about fourteen hundred applications across Takeda. Uh, so I kind of own the application maintenance service uh, along with uh, database administration and, uh, and testing. I also run the data program um, for um, for IT, uh, as well as uh, I chair the Global Data Council at Takeda, uh, which basically is uh, defining the enterprise uh, strategy for you know, for data. Mm-hmm. And I also manage a team that, that is called the Digital Products and uh, DevOps, which is actually focused on uh, uh, the creation of services for um, capabilities such as uh, mobile, web, uh, RPA, um, virtual agents, uh, and, and basically I serve the enterprise. Uh, so as, as different uh, teams need uh, this type of capability encapsulated into, into their solutions, and we actually get engaged to, to, de- to deliver this, uh, this type of uh, value. So I guess it's a great introduction and seems like you are one of those experienced CTOs who have done all uh, this kind of work all their lives and, and, and it's pretty, Pretty impressive CV. So uh, uh, while you're, uh, while, while before we start off to that, I mean, there are many, many roles in an organization, the tech leadership roles, uh, CTO, CIOs, uh, VP of professional services, director of software development. So how a role of a CTO differentiates from, from the other roles in the, uh, in the general world and particularly in your organization? Uh, so uh, to me, the CTO, uh, the T in the CTO is not, not really a chief technology officer, but it's kind of more the chief transformation officer in a way. Mm-hmm. I kind of feel that my role is more uh, to transform uh, the organization to become more digitally uh, connected. Uh, and then if we actually want to get into the definition of digital, which I think we will, uh, I'll explain exactly what that means. Uh, but but um, you know, I see my role as, uh, uh, as introducing uh, a different way of... Uh, Leveraging technology to uh, to redefine how we actually do or deliver products uh, and services within my company and uh, quite frankly across across healthcare. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I mean, as you as you uh, said, we'll talk more about digital. I mean, digital transformation is a buzzword, and and digital transformation means different things to different people. So uh, we'll be happy to understand how you see digital transformation. Yeah, so digital is uh, is one of these words that um, that that is uh, you know exciting and confusing at the same time, or basically yep. people don't uh, don't quite actually apply the same definition. From my perspective, uh, the word digital uh, is actually used to uh, define a new method of uh, uh, collecting information about a process uh, in real time. So it's, it's more of the acceleration uh, of um, uh, data collection uh, to, to really understand how a process and or a service is actually performing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that comes from uh, the perspective of uh, uh, most people actually, you know, almost connect digital to, to mobile in some, in, in some cases. Some other cases, it's actually the collection of uh, uh, devices that basically collect information in real time. Uh, and... Uh, so, for instance, you know, in Industry 4.0, uh, digital is actually really the, the instrumentation of, uh, of sensors, right, in a production line to kind of really understand and measure uh, how the product is, uh, you know, is, is basically moving from one, um, one station, per se, to the next. Um, but um, 
Digital to me is also around customer experience and making sure that you are actually offering the light to your customers. So uh, in a way, a digital program um, is really becoming more, um, rather than actually uh, defining solutions from the inside out, for business mm -hmm. companies thinking of how to actually produce services to their customers. Uh, digital to me is, uh, is flipping that um, perspective to kind of really let the customer really drive uh, the definition of how your product should actually you know, change and or uh, adapt to, to different situations. So the, the, the definition of personas actually comes to mind where basically you're trying to actually segment your, um, your clientele and then uh, defining services that are more customized and personalized right, uh, to, to, your, to your customers. So, so if, if I just try to rephrase, rephrase it or try to get your information on it, uh, I mean, digitization has been in, uh, in place uh, for, for many, many decades now and uh, companies doing a lot of stuff they call digital and they are digitizing information. And then uh, all of this information was getting uh, created in silos and then digital transformation came in and, and, and you started integrating a lot of this digital information. But I, I feel that you have taken it to uh, a different, whole new different level where, where a digital transformation uh, that is used to serve an organization, you have really taken it to a level where you are saying that the entire digital transformation journey needs to be defined by your customer experience and then you work backwards from there to create experience and digital transformation or digital assets or digital processes that eventually serve that particular customer need. Is this a, I mean, did I understand it correctly? Is this something? Yeah, yeah. I feel that basically the, uh, the, um, the start of digital transformation uh, happened when uh, networks and connectivity has become ubiquitous, right? So, so the fact that we actually have a phone, pretty much every person almost has a phone in their pocket, that actually is, uh, the ability to actually reach a consumer, no, no matter who you are, no matter what kind of service you're trying to actually, you know, uh, receive, being, uh, you know, getting into a cab, to ordering, uh, you know, your lunch, to, uh, you know, finding a doctor. Uh, so the, the phone basically, uh, and the network, more than the device itself, the network itself actually has been the enabler of this digital transformation. The second thing has been, Again, networks. Uh, so in, in manufacturing facilities now, uh, they're all wirelessly connected. They're all connected. So every, every device, everything is connecting through the network. So the transformation itself, uh, once you actually are connected to your customer through a phone, now all of a sudden you can actually switch into measurement, right? And, uh, and so the, the measurement component is how do your customers are, how do they interact with your product? Um, how do they try to actually ask for your services? Uh, and obviously, you know, a lot of information is being generated by the phone. What I am, who I'm with, where I'm going, what I've been. Uh, so so that there is just a lot of behavioral information that now all of a sudden is helping anyone that basically has access to the information, customize the services based on who you are, who your interests are, who your friends are. Now again, there is also a lot of controversy in terms of, um, you know, what information do I make available? Well, I think that this is actually the beautiful thing about technology, right? Because technically, you can customize your experience to, to whatever level you would like. Uh, so basically, if you actually want for services to actually come to you, then you basically need to obviously reveal more and more about your digital identity mm -hmm. versus if you don't care about it or if you're actually more concerned about privacy, then basically you can actually scale down that level of uh, um, you know, information sharing about yourself but then at the point, basically, you're limiting yourself to the service that basically can be provided by your choices, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, it's kind of really what, uh, I mean, the enabler of, of this digital transformation to me is the fact that basically everything is connected. And then there is actually a component of processing and customization of services that is kind of really more tied to the, to the capacity and the computing power and the amount of information and big data that can actually be stored to now personalize the service based on who you are, the population you belong to, your interests, you know, in other aspects, the bills are more common to you compared to someone else. So that's that's an interesting thing. And I see if you can jump in any time that you want. That's, the, that's an interesting uh, comment that you made that the basis of a digital transformation is basically now because everything is connected. And I was reading somewhere and uh, uh, probably um, one of on the IBM's blog and they, they say that now, what is beyond digital transformation? And they say that it's a cognitive transformation. So that is more 
uh, an organization that is built around AI and machine learning. But the basis of that cognitive transformation is digital transformation. Unless and until you have a digital transformation in place, you cannot really go for that uh, cognitive transformation. And uh, essentially, the, the AI and machine learning are really now uh, uh, getting pace because we, the organizations are em uh, embracing more and more digital transformation. So I guess uh, that's how it is. So in terms of the overall life cycle, uh, do you feel that enterprises and large enterprises, they are really now at a stage where they feel and they have embraced this digital transformation and they have, uh, they have adopted it as a whole or we are still in, in the early stages of digital transformation? I mean, how do you feel about the uh, industry in general, especially healthcare in particular? And, I feel that, uh, yeah, and, and, just, and, just to, and just to add to that, what Omer just said about the AI and machine learning. So we have also seen that there is a push, right, towards uh, like AI and machine learning and cognitive transformation, as Omer mentioned, in, in various organizations. However, in some cases, I mean, the processes in the enterprise and the data, which is sort of the basis of all, all this uh, processing, is lacking in, in, some, in many of the cases, I would say. So, I mean, where, where, I mean, just to add to that, where do you see that going uh, in parallel? I mean, I, I kind of really feel that, uh, you know, this transformation is uh, fundamentally changing uh, how we actually live our lives. So it's, it's, that, it's that drastic, right? Uh, and again, it's probably not now, maybe not in the next five years, but definitely in the next 10 years, uh, we, we're actually going to start to understand exactly how profound uh, you know, the, apl the application of machine learning and AI is going to be in our lives. Um, so, for instance, in the medical field, uh, the example that I always use is if you're actually going to the doctor, uh, you're basically relying on uh, his education, his intuition, uh, his experience, right, to, to kind of, you know, diagnose more or less uh, what he sees in that uh, five to ten minutes, right, and then uh, he, he basically delivers some sort of a, uh, you know, guess as to uh, what you have, uh, the kind of medicine that might actually be able to actually cure what he perceived that you have, uh, but it's not empirical. So it's, a, it's highly, uh, it's this guesswork uh, that basically is indeed, uh, you know, funded on the experience, intuition, and, uh, you know, and, and the education of the doctor. So you're actually now switching into machine learning and artificial intelligence. It's a lot more empirical. Obviously, it requires a lot more data. Uh, so as in, uh, the more you actually instrument an individual with uh, you know, devices, I mean, I, I, I have plenty of devices. I have a, a ring that basically detects my heart rate uh, you know, for 24-7. Uh, I have uh, straps for my watch that basically are detecting, you know, changing in my, my sweat, changing in my, uh, you know, fat body composition but throughout the day. Uh, and, and there are many more devices that basically I've, I've been using, you know, throughout my life. I have a... Uh, I, have a, I can actually put on a 24 seven uh, EKG device. And these are all devices that now actually cost uh, less, than, less than $50, right? So the fact that we can actually generate this amount of data, this is actually just for healthcare, right? It's completely transforming the role of the doctor uh, because quite frankly, when I'm actually showing up at my doctor and, and they actually put me on a scale and they measure my weight with my clothes on and whatever, right? And then they actually estimate more or less my BMI, you know, I show up and say, you know, I have about 12 years worth of, of history of my weight daily. In the morning, uh, before I work out, after I work out, before I go to sleep. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly how this one data point can actually really give you any idea. You have your steps, you have your exercise minutes, you have your heart rate, you have your sleeping heart rate, resting heart rate, every single thing. Yeah, so basically, if you're actually looking at the role of the doctor, right, um, and, and any other, you know, so any other really profession, right, will become obsolete almost because, uh, frankly, the part in which, you know, for instance, you know, we have we have a data program uh, at Takeda, uh, mm -hmm. and I've been violently opposed to actually calling the data program a data and analytics program. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in analytics actually being uh, the art of an individual reading a chart, making a decision. There are so many elements in the decision that basically are faulty, including the experience and education of that individual that makes the decision, versus when you actually can rely on a massive amount of data, now all of a sudden you actually are starting to actually become a lot more empirical about the decision, right? Now obviously the models need to be trained and they need to actually be coded by an individual, so basically there are choices of what information would you use to actually make a decision. But ultimately, 
uh, you know, an AI um, uh, or a machine learning algorithm will make a mistake, but it will learn from the mistake. And by the way, that is actually broadcasted across any sort of algorithm that has, has ever existed to kind of, you know, autocorrect itself. The example that I always use, and I know that I'm kind of, you know, going long here, but um, uh, Tesla, right, and the autopilot. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly what your driving record is, right? My driver record is okay. You know, I, 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 li I like to actually speed. I've not had too many accidents, but I do know now actually how to detect when the road is icy. I know exactly how to drive when the road, when the road is uh, wet. Um, but my kids are going to have to go through the same exact steps of learning that you and I always had when you actually push on the brakes and the car is actually going straight on ice, right? Now, the beautiful thing about AI, uh, and, and the problem there is the fact that basically I cannot, I cannot tell my kids exactly what it feels like to auto skid. They need to feel it. The thing with AI is the fact that basically once the single, the single first car basically skids on ice, it learns, and every other car that basically has that capability has learned in that one yeah. second. So that to me is really the power of AI and machine learning, the fact that basically, you know, it's, a, it's ubiquitous and it's immediate. And so the learning, the learning globally, right, will, will basically increase exponentially in areas in which basically humankind, right, just based on our limitation of communication via verbal uh, or written, uh, you know, it's just unparalleled, right? And so, so we like would, one large brain. Yeah, no, it's a, and, and uh, to me, it's 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 con it's the connectivity component, and it's how transferable that uh, um, experience will become through um, machine learning algorithms and AI, right? So, so just on a tangent, do you believe that Skynet is going to happen? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Do, do, I, do, do, I, do, do I believe that, uh, do, so I'm, I'm sorry, can you actually repeat the question? <laughs> so, the, so the Skynet from the Terminator, is it going well, to Well, I'm not sure about the Skynet. No, I'm not sure about Skynet. Sky, Skynet to me is, you know, fiction, right? But what, what, what I'm saying is uh, that um, the, um, you know, artificial intelligence will definitely play a huge role in, uh, in how we, um, will apply uh, these digital foundations. So to me is the fact that we're actually collecting so much data, it's just the beginning of, uh, of the feeding of a model, right? So the fact that we basically have technically unlimited storage now, right? Um, it, it will allow us to kind of really, it, it's kind of really a, a matter of, uh, of compute power now. Uh, and, uh, and then I think we're gonna be, we're gonna be accelerating. But it's, I don't think that, I, I think that humans will actually be smarter than, uh, and I, I believe that basically everything around AI and machine learning is all done for, for good reasons, right? Yeah, and, and, and there's, a, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of distance to cover before we get to artificial general intelligence. Uh, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so great. So, so now that we uh, understand the digital transformation and uh, what it takes to, to create one, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, change gears and take the conversation towards the ROI part. So, I mean, digital organizations go through the digital transformation because they want to get a certain ROI or uh, also as a role of, as a CTO, uh, you are responsible for making this happen. So tell us, talk to us more about how your role as a CTO involves in uh, bringing an ROI uh, to the company, or uh, uh, how you how you how you use technology? I mean, many times you, you you're just doing technology for the sake of technology when it comes to a low level. But at your level, uh, every technological decision needs to bring in an ROI. So, what kind of a structure? What kind of an organization? What kind of parameters you should be thinking while making technology decisions as a CTO uh, that it can really uh, position you well to bring an ROI to your enterprise? Yeah, so uh, it's both a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. The top-down approach is, is having a clear understanding of what the, uh, pretty much the, 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 the mission and the vision of the company is really driving to, right? So that, that kind of really creates uh, the definition of principles of what value to an organization uh, really is. Um, there has to be maturity in how you actually create a portfolio of programs and or products, you know, lately. Um, uh, but but that, that kind of really defines more or less what are the, we actually define the value streams of the organization. So we actually have 
processes or top 10 processes that, that basically make the, our organization successful. Mm-hmm. We try to actually optimize these processes best we can using lean uh, type of type of an approach, right? And uh, kind of understanding the value add, non-value add components of the process. Uh, and then we actually start to apply, um, you know, uh, the, the, the idea of if this is actually our core process, let's actually start to analyze what data is the process using, right, end to end. And now all of a sudden we start to break up from a data centric perspective, the different uh, uh, systems uh, and, and the different data repositories, uh, the different reports, the different data that we buy or that, that we you know, e- e- interface. And so you actually start to break up that process into its level of complexity of, of, of technology, data, data, and then you actually get into data integrity, data lineage, data you know, uh, quality. Um, and all of these actually become extremely expensive when you don't actually have uh, a, a very good transfer of information from one component to the process of, you know, to the next. Once you basically actually have that, uh, the, that end-to-end understanding of the cost of your process, right now all of a sudden you can actually start to, to, to refine it uh, into how do you actually optimize the process so that basically the unit cost of whatever you're trying to do is actually going to be less because of the fact that you're reducing the complexity. So the story is you go from the value stream to the process, the process to the technology complexity, and then the most important component of being able to actually drive change through a baselining process is actually knowing your total cost of ownership, right? So, mm-hmm. and the total cost of ownership is not just about an application or a system, but indeed it's actually the cost of ownership to actually run a process. Now, in its individual components, uh, like you know, the application level, we do try to actually come up with a total cost of ownership. And as you know, um, if you actually try to have a bunch of technologies define the total cost of ownership of an application, mm. you never get over it because every technologist is actually focused on actually making the total cost of ownership precise and exact, mm-hmm. but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. So uh, we kind of break up... Um, the, the total cost of ownership in about five different stages. Uh, so the first stage is actually the, the cost of uh, implementation mm-hmm. of a solution or a technology. And then uh, there are basically some steady state um, categories. One is actually really the um, uh, kind of like you know, the, the, the application cost. So being uh, the software licenses, the, the software maintenance, uh, the hosting uh, cost. Mm-hmm. Um, then you actually have costs that basically are more related to um, the changes that you actually apply to the to the application itself. So it's not the software maintenance, but it's more about the maintenance of the application itself. So now that I actually bought the application, how much does it actually cost me to actually keep it alive, keep 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 it going? Like you know, the system upgrades, the application upgrades, basically the, the, the little things that you need to actually do to keep the application running. The third category is kind of really more around projects. So now, what are the projects that basically are using my technology or application? It can actually be, again, the value stream cost. But every time I'm actually spending money to, you know, make configuration changes to the app, uh, adding views or creating reports or whatever, that, that's all cost that I'm actually keep adding to the application and the asset. So these three categories, again, the software cost, the uh, kind of like, you know, the, the maintenance cost for, you know, for, for, for the team and then eventually the, the, the configuration changes or the, the, the upgrade cost. Mm. And the last component uh, is actually really the retirement uh, cost. If you were to retire this application, how many other applications do you need to upgrade? Or where will I actually move this process to and what changes do I need to actually make to these systems in order for me to eliminate the application? So we kind of have all of that very well defined for every application we have which makes us uh, very agile when we're actually trying to, um, to calculate really the cost of, uh, the total cost of process. Uh, and actually what we define is the unit cost. I can actually go into unit cost uh, calculations, but basically the, 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 the fundamental KPI of um, total cost of ownership and ROI to us is the unit cost. So basically if I actually have the total cost of an application, and I now actually try to figure out exactly how is this application used. Okay, the application is actually used to deliver whatever, a thousand vials of, uh, of vaccine. So you, you can actually start to measure some value KPIs, right? That basically the application is, is, uh, is helping. And you can actually start to, 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 to divide. You know, if I'm delivering uh, 10 million vials a day, right, and my application is costing X, then the added cost to the product or the net product is 
pennies, right? So basically, I, I, I can actually continue to, to support the application because the value that it delivers is great. Versus other application where you, 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 you might be spending a million dollar and you only have 10 users for this application using it. And because no one even knows about the application anymore or was not kind of really uh, served across the enterprise. Uh, and so, um, so there are basically decisions you can actually make on unit cost uh, that they basically drive uh, your, your ability to, to, to rationalize or, or further invest in communication to, to kind of expand the, expand the usage of the application itself. This is, this is, I must have to say, this has been one of the most comprehensive answers I've ever got on our related this question, that how you're taking right from the process and system and really broken it down to, and I'm, I'm really amazed to see that if in, within your organization, you are uh, doing measurement every such at every particular level so that you can really, really understand that. Now, this takes me to a question that uh, you uh, you have described the way you can go right really from a process cost to a unit cost and then figure out the ROI. You feel in terms of uh, the organizational structure or the way your uh, uh, sub-org has been set up and the people are in the hierarchy and needs to be set up in a certain way and there needs to be a certain trust between groups and processes, uh, groups and people uh, among themselves to make yeah. sure that you really measure it correctly, you really get to that level instead of going through the red tape and, and bureaucracy. I mean, how the org should be really be setting up and what should be the confidence and the softest things that, that, that you need around to make such thing happen? Yeah, so it's kind of multidimensional, right? Uh, so we basically have three different groups of, uh, of, um, of actors, I guess, in this process. One is actually the application owner, Mm -hmm. The application owner is someone that basically knows about the application and the cost. So basically, it's the person that basically is, is feeding the TCO model, right? And obviously, they're responsible for uh, you know the, the the health of the application um, and knowing where the application is being used. So that's actually one role. The second role is kind of more of the process owner, right? So the people that now actually know how to actually go from A through you know A through Z. The fact is, you know, in a global company some of these processes, right? While you, you might actually define the, the perfect process, that process actually takes on a different uh, articulation when you actually are going to, to different countries. So you might actually have the definition of what this is actually what the process should be, but then if you're actually going to different countries, yeah, well, they still kind of follow more or less the same process, but they don't use the same systems. They skip a step, they add a step, you know, so, so the, the, the articulations that basically are not the same. Now, the third most important pro, uh, component is actually more about looking at uh, all of this from a data perspective. Uh, because uh, data, quite frankly, uh, just, you know, our, our learning uh, is that the more you actually are in control of the definition of data, right? And basically, we have a definition of uh, basically 26 different uh, data entities uh, or data domain, as we call them, across Takeda that defines basically the entire data landscape at the company. We govern 10 of them. We don't govern all 26, but just with the 10 that we actually govern basically have, uh, we actually have a good ability to kind of understand more or less what are the processes that are effective, uh, affected, what are the systems that are affected, and with that basically creates a, uh, a good uh, you know, ecosystem of controls to, to basically start to actually structure a discussion around what do we need to optimize, what systems do, don't we need, how can we actually organize the data better, um, how can we actually learn from, from different regions, right? What is the best implementation of the process? So the process optimization actually happens in communities, right? So we have, we have a very strong network of, of communities around data, around process, not necessarily around systems because, you know, everyone is kind of you know, different, but this will be definitely data and process is, is key. Uh, I, I think I got my answers and I think you're a pretty well placed. See if you want to say something. Yeah. So, I mean, now that we are moved to, uh, moving towards like the role of CTO and Umair has like uh, touched upon that. So, I mean, we have really seen that there are primarily two sort of uh, two types of companies, as we say. First one are the services company, which basically provide services, for example, telcos and sort of other companies provide services to their customers. The other one is the product companies where they have like a, a product and then, then they offer this product to their customers. Now, CDO role is primarily, in my experience, geared more towards, uh, I mean, product companies where, I mean, product companies has a specific title for a CTO and people 
vouch for it or um, I mean, they proudly sort of say that. In services company, that sort of role is not as glamorized as like other executives. So in your experience, what have you seen the difference between the two? Uh, is a CTO role actually applicable to a services company? How do you think about it? Yeah, um, so to me, a product com- company is a services company uh, as well. Uh, and if you think of a product as, a, as something that you actually sell and become a service, I think it's the same thing now. I do feel that um, uh, you know the CTO comp- uh, part of the, of the services company is probably more focused on uh, um, you know on, on the uh, data uh, and the digital aspects of how the service is actually being portrayed uh, through their customers. I think uh, you know there is a component of you. Be- can, you know, be being ubiquitous around um, sharing experiences, like we're actually talking about consulting companies, right? I mean, I've been part of a few consulting companies uh, as well. And uh, the focus of the CTO in this case is more around, um, you know, make, making sure that basically your people are extremely effective. Uh, so there, there are a lot of technologies like, you know, document uh, management, knowledge management, Mm-hmm. Uh, and the ability to, to, to kind of, you know, craft a presentation or find experiences that some other consultant uh, has had in a similar client in a similar situation and giving you basically a product that is almost ready to actually be customized as for your specific client, that to me is, is huge value, right? So the role of the CTO uh, really doesn't change between, between, uh, between the two now. Obviously, in product companies, you know, it's more visible in a way because you can actually touch it. In services company, uh, I think it's actually more increased revenue. And, and also, uh, there is a huge component of intelligence, right, on the customers and the people that you're actually about to visit. So to me, is when, I was, uh, when I was working for, you know, one of the consulting firms, I was actually working in their internal IT department. Mm-hmm. And then the focus was indeed around um, customer intelligence, right? So kind of, you know, knowing, knowing your customer before you actually interface with them, knowing and understanding what, uh, what, what they actually want to, what, want to buy now again. From a services company, other services. If you're actually talking about cabs, and uh, so I, I don't know exactly by, by, by what you know the definition of services is kind of loose for me, but but um, but yeah. So um, I, I think that the role of the CTO, more or less, I think it, it's about the same. So to me, again, where, where T is more of a transformation component, right? Kind of you know, always thinking about you know one two steps ahead of uh, the market. Um, I think the role of the CTO is, is also one that basically learns from different industries. So I, now, I never actually look at the pharmaceutical industry, for instance, you know, now, right, as the only industry that I can actually learn from. As a matter of fact, I don't want to learn from my peers uh, because, quite frankly, it will be an inter- incremental learning. We're all trying to actually do the same thing, you know. So I must prefer to actually start to look, look, look at other companies, right? So what can I learn, again, from, from a car manufacturing company or what can I learn from... Uh, uh, SpaceX, right? So, as in, uh, it does not matter. So, as in, uh, I think that technology, applied technology, and especially applied data, is really transformational, and that's what what the role of the CTO is. Right, and and just to follow up to that, I mean, we have seen there are various groups in any organization or various business units, and so do you think that there is like a possibility of having each unit or each group having its own CTO? And then they basically work together to achieve the, I mean, the overall goal in terms yeah. of technology for, for the company or the organization. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, I wish I actually had, you know, uh, clones of, of myself, you know, across the organization to, to be able to kind of capture uh, really what the business really wants. I mean, from my perspective, um, the role of the uh, corporate CTO, right? It's kind of really more about creating a set of services that can actually be commoditized across the enterprise. But then if you actually have different CTOs uh, in the different parts of the organization, of course, you know, they're a lot more specialized uh, in that specific segment of, um, uh, you know, knowledge, right, and, uh, and talent. Um, you know, I mean, a pharmaceutical company basically is made up of more or less is three organizations. One is the research and development. So in, in research and development, are two completely distinct, uh, uh, you know, industries, right? Um, then you actually have uh, the manufacturing component, right? Manufacturing is is, is huge. Um, there is a lot of engineering. That it's, it's it's fascinating, you know, how we actually put together the manufacturing facility, right? You know, to, to kind of you know develop a, a pharmaceutical product, like it, like any other manufacturing facility, being shoes or being cars, right? Doesn't matter. 
And then you basically have the sales component. Now, the sales component in our case is actually very different. Uh, sales and marketing, we don't market necessarily. What we do actually have some advertising on TV. But, but there is a whole, so what we're kind of three completely, that there is a whole logistics industry, right, for, you know, that, that, we, uh, that, that we actually put together to kind of distribute our products. Um, and then obviously there is kind of like, you know, this experience of, of customer. Then the customer, we actually call it the patient. Uh, that obviously is, a, you know, patient interaction is not something that usually a pharmaceutical company does. I mean, how many times have you picked up the phone and called the pharmaceutical company that made the product that you're ingesting? Not too many people do. You call your doctor, right? So we try to actually cater to doctors and hospitals, of course, and uh, key opinion leaders, as we call them. So these are actually people that kind of know about a specific uh, uh, illness, right? And then basically they can speak about our product in a large audience to basically advertise the, uh, you know, the value that we, that we deliver. You guys, just, just to keep, make sure that we keep this podcast within certain limits, i just uh, take the liberty to ask the last question related to the podcast, and which is that how do you see the role of a CTO getting involved in the next decade or so? Well, uh, the CTO has always been a role in evolution, right? Uh, I don't, don't feel that basically the talk of the CTO 15 years ago is the same as now. I feel that basically the next 10 years are going to be mostly focused on data mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, and kind of really trying to, to, to kind of really understand exactly what to do with data. So the data to me was kind of really more of a second thought uh, versus now I think is actually going to become more of a, a spotlight. So as in uh, people now are starting to understand that basically if you have a digital program with a weak data program, you basically are adding complexity. You're not really delivering a lot of value. If you actually have a data program, and then you leverage basically your data platform, as we call it, right, uh, to basically deliver digital products that are connected to the platform that eventually you're, uni- you're, you're infinitely scalable. The model that basically we try to actually follow are basically of digital data native companies, right, uh, mm-hmm. such as Facebook, uh, Facebook or Amazon, or uh, these are old companies that basically have started uh, being digital natives, but their strategy is all revolving around data. data so, yep. The data is the center, and then they eventually continue to deliver product based on the data that they know. Mm-hmm. But they, they're, they're, they're solely focused on the data about their customer. And then the more information they know about their customer, the more they know how to actually deliver product that basically are going to be in line with what their customer want. Sure. So it's kind of like you know, the outside in thinking again. Yeah, yeah I guess. I guess. So, so, the role, so the next 10 years is around data and, and stuff that you can get out of. And uh, in, in real time, so I, I can really feel that, uh, uh, that there, there is a component of um, uh, collaboration. Uh, I don't believe that basically companies will, uh, you know, the brick walls type of thing, uh, or basically it's brick and mortar, and basically you know exactly what your company is because you can actually visit the different buildings. is completely disintegrating where even the architecture of microservices and APIs, right, is kind of really inviting us to collaborate in real time and. Uh, and really delivering values by, you know, picking picking the component of your process right that you can actually outsource and or uh, leverage externally, uh, especially including analytics. I think that there's going to be a much more specialized industry for analytics based on again different industries, right, and uh, and different components of the value chain. Where basically a company will specialize specifically on the AI and machine learning of that specific part of the process, mm. and it will be far more. Uh, inexpensive and, and uh, you know and affordable to leverage the service rather than actually trying to build that AI yourself, right? So basically, I think uh, the specialization of services is going to become a lot more ubiquitous. And so the role of the CTO to me will evolve into being a broker of all these services and being able to actually streamline, uh, you know, these capabilities that basically external vendors will actually will actually offer to to produce your own value chain. So CTO will be a broker in the next. Decade. I think it's going to be a broker of microservices in a way, right? So right. If you, if you, if you, but, but focus still on, uh, on basically retaining the data as basically your, your core asset. Yeah. So Leo, thank you very much for giving us all yeah. this insightful discussion and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure our audience will enjoy a lot about that and uh, I can thank you enough. 